Gotta catch them all. It's been the slogan of the Pokemon games since the very beginning. It's the ultimate goal for every Pokemon trainer. It's the mark of a true Pokemon master. But how hard is it to actually do? If you really wanted to catch every Pokemon, how long would it take? This seemingly simple question has led me down perhaps the deepest rabbit hole on the channel yet, forcing me to learn about everything from advanced probability and statistics to geometric distributions to alternate realities layered within alternate realities. And today, I'm going to take you on that journey with me. This is the average number of encounters required to complete the red and blue Pokedex. Richard, hit that intro. A huge thanks to Aspa102 and FS for suggesting this video topic on my Patreon-exclusive Discord server. More information on that in the description down below. This topic was inspired by a video by Numberphile, where they use geometric distributions to estimate that you'd need an average of 751 encounters to find every Pokémon in the Kanto Pokédex. It's a great video. But they did make a couple of pretty big assumptions and simplifications that make their answer not quite as accurate as it could be. Now, to be clear, I don't have any problems with these assumptions. The real goal of that video was to teach you about geometric distributions. If they need to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy to do so, I totally get it. But... Whenever I make assumptions in a math-heavy video, there's always a couple of people that aren't too pleased with me, to say the least. People who'd rather I increase the complexity of every problem tenfold in order to account for every tiny little detail to get the most accurate answer possible. So today, we're gonna do exactly that. We are going to find the true average number of encounters you would need in order to obtain all 150 Pokemon in the red and blue Pokedex. No assumptions, no shortcuts, just pure accuracy. How hard could it be? To start, our job here might be a bit easier than originally thought because you don't actually need to encounter all 150 Pokemon to complete the Pokedex. Take starters, for example. You get one free starter for every save file. Just get a couple of friends to trade you their starters, and you can have all three of these Pokemon, no encounters necessary. I definitely used real friends to get mine, and didn't just shell out money to get an extra Game Boy and another copy of the game to trade them to myself. Nope. Real friends. All told, there are 10 gift Pokemon in the game that you don't need to encounter, which brings the real total required encounters to 140. There's another five that you can get from in-game trades using Pokemon you've already caught, and there's also static Pokemon in the game that you can battle simply by talking to them in the overworld, rather than a random encounter. You still need to battle and catch them, of course, but there's no chance involved in finding them, so it didn't feel right to include them in a list like this. And then, of course, there's evolutions. If you catch a Rattata, you don't actually need to find Eradicate. You can simply get your Rattata up to level 20 and it will evolve into Eradicate and get registered in your Pokedex that way. True, in some instances it might be easier to catch the evolve form of a Pokemon rather than battling the Elite Four a million times to evolve all your garbage bugs and rodents, but you don't technically have to encounter any of them. So, throwing out all the gift 
trade static and evolution Pokemon, out of the total 150, you only have to actually encounter and catch 53 of them, including two Spearows, one of them to trade and one to evolve into a Fero. Considering that, it seems like catching them all might be a bit easier than we thought. The other big assumption that Numberphile made is that every Pokemon is equally rare and all appear in one single area. So, on any given encounter, you're equally likely to encounter a Zubat or a Charizard or a Mewtwo. As I'm sure you all know though, that's not how the game works. Depending on the route you're on, certain Pokemon will be insanely common, others will be incredibly rare, and most are straight up unattainable. They chose not to account for this because, in their words, But we're not gonna model that, it's too hard. Uh, but I think that we can do a little better than that. I mean, how hard could it be? There is one final assumption that I am going to keep though, and that's assuming that you catch every Pokemon on your first attempt. If you're trying to complete the Pokedex, odds are you've got a huge stock of Ultra Balls and a Pokemon with a good status condition to make catching them easier. If you're failing encounters at that point, I'm gonna chalk that up to a skill issue. With one notable exception that I'll talk about later. So with all that in mind, how do we go about finding something like this? Well, the best place to start is with a plan. I pulled together a list of every Pokemon you need to encounter to complete Red and Blue's Pokedex, and found the most common area where each of those Pokemon is available. As an example, Pidgey can be found on just about every route in the game, but it's most common on Route 1 so you're best off searching for one there. So what we're left with is a list of routes and all the Pokemon you should be searching for when you're on those routes. If we simply visit these areas one by one and don't leave until we have everything we want, then before you know it, you'll have a full dex. Now, all we have to do is find the average number of encounters you'll need on each individual route before you find all the Pokemon you're looking for and add them all together. That doesn't sound too bad. In the number file video, we learn that the average number of encounters required to find any one Pokemon is one over the probability of encountering it. I won't go into the full proof here, you can check out their video if you want to learn more, but intuitively this makes sense. If a Rattata has a 50% spawn rate on Route 1, then you can expect to find one in two encounters. It gets a bit more complicated when you throw in multiple Pokemon and different spawn rates, but in essence, we can use this one simple equation for every single route in the game. For this video, we'll be searching for Pokemon from most common to least common, because it makes it easier to explain, and it increases the chance that you'll happen upon a rarer Pokemon while searching for the more common ones, as opposed to finding 2 billion Pikachus while searching for that rare Electabuzz. With that in mind, we begin with Tentacool, which has a 100% spawn rate while surfing on Route 19, or really most water routes in the game. That means that it will take one encounter to find a tentacle. Huh, well that was pretty easy. Oh. The next area we set our sights on is Diglett's Cave. Here you have a 95% chance of encountering a Diglett and a 5% chance of encountering a Dugtrio. Now in most games, it wouldn't actually matter which of these Pokemon you encountered. If you find a Diglett, then you can just evolve it into a Dugtrio, or if you find a Dugtrio, then you can just throw it in the daycare and hatch yourself a Diglett. Either way, you'll wind up with both Pokemon in your decks. But remember, we're looking at the Pokedex for red and blue specifically, and in those games, there is no daycare meaning that you have no way of creating that Diglett egg. This means that in order to complete the Pokedex, we absolutely must encounter a Diglett here. 
So using the same equation, we can divide one by Diglett's spawn chance, which we'll call PD, and find that we can expect to find a Diglett in 1.05 encounters. We can use this same very simple process for any route in the game where we're only looking for one Pokemon. Unfortunately, things get a little more complicated when you start throwing in multiple required Pokemon. Take Route 6 as an example. If you fish with the good rod, you have a 50% chance of finding either a Goldeen or a Poliwag. And in this case, we actually want both of these Pokemon. For that reason, we need to modify our equation a tiny bit. Instead of using the spawn probability for one specific Pokemon, we want to use the probability of finding something that we don't already have. So on our first encounter, we want either a Goldeen or a Poliwag, it doesn't matter which. So we can do one over the probability of finding a Poliwag plus the probability of finding a Goldeen. Since they're the only two Pokemon on this route, the odds of finding one or the other is simply 100%. So on the first encounter, we are guaranteed to find something we don't already have. We'll call this first encounter T1. So say on the first encounter you find a Poliwag and catch it. Well, now for your second encounter, T2, you have a 50% chance of encountering a Goldeen and then you're done. But you also have a 50% chance of encountering another Poliwag, which you don't need anymore. Or if you caught Goldeen first, then it's the other way around. Either way, you now only have a 50% chance of finding a new Pokemon, meaning that it will take you an average of another two encounters to find the second Pokemon, T2. Add that to the one encounter from T1, and we find that it will take you an average of three encounters to find both Poliwag and Goldeen. Okay, so adding in a second Pokemon makes it a little more complicated, but still not that bad, especially when both Pokemon are equally rare. And for the first couple of routes we explore, this will be enough. But as you go further into the game, a few more complicating factors arise that we need to account for. Take Route 11, for example. If you're playing Pokemon Red, then you can find Spiro, Ekans, and Drowsy on this route. While you do need Spiro for your decks, it's far more common elsewhere, so you don't need to catch one here specifically. The only Pokemon we actually need here are Ekans and Drowsy. Effectively, we have the same two Pokemon setup that we did with the Poliwag and Goldeen on Route 6, only with one major difference. Ekans and Drowsy have different spawn chances. For the first encounter, this doesn't matter much, we simply add their two probabilities together, and finally you have a 65% chance of finding either an Ekans or a Drowsy. Plug that into our equation, and we find that you can expect to find one of these two Pokemon in about 1.5 encounters. But now, we run into some trouble. Say you found the Ekans first. Well, now you have a 25% chance to find a Drowsy, meaning it will take you an average of four more encounters. Add them together, and it should take you 5.5 encounters to get both. But it's also possible that you found the Drowsy first, in which case you now have a 40% chance to find the Ekans, which will only take you an average of 2.5 encounters, or 4 encounters for the whole route. So we have two different scenarios with different likelihoods of occurring. To reconcile these two and find the average number of encounters for the whole route in any scenario, we need to take the weighted average, meaning we need to multiply each expected encounter total for the second Pokemon by its likelihood of occurring and then add them together. So what's the likelihood that we found an Ekans on the first encounter? Well, you might think that it's simply 40%, its spawn rate for the route. But remember, if we made it to T2, it means that we had to have encountered either an Ekans or a Drowsy on T1, 
If we encountered a Spiro, then we'd still be on T1. So what we need to do is divide the probability of finding an Ekans by the probability of finding either an Ekans or a Drowsy, which are the only two possible encounters that would have allowed us to make it to T2. This gets us the adjusted probability. We'll call this PE prime. E for Ekans and prime for it's different. We then multiply that by the expected number of encounters for a drowsy, and then repeat that process for PD prime. If we simply add these two together, then we'll find that it will take you an average of 3.4 encounters to find the second Pokemon, whichever it may be. Add that to the 1.5 from before, and we find that it will take you an average of 4.9 encounters to find both a drowsy and it Ekans on Route 11. And thankfully, that's all the math that we need to do for this route. There is nothing else that will make this even more complicated than it already was. Uh, we're done, we can just move on. Ah, hello, it's me, Charlie from another dimension. It's about to get more complicated. Because while the easiest place to find an Ekans is on Route 11, you also have a 25% chance of finding it on Route 10, which by this point you'll have already visited. Since it wasn't very common on Route 10, it was more efficient to wait to search for it here, but there is a chance that you already found one while searching for the Voltorb that you actually wanted there. And if that's the case, then you don't actually need to search for the Ekans here at all. You can just catch a Drowsy and then move on. So, not only are there two alternate universes where you found either a Drowsy or an Ekans first, but there's also a third alternate universe where you already had an Ekans coming into this route. That means that we need to take another weighted average for the expected encounters for both an Ekans and a Drowsy, which we just did, and the expected encounters for just a Drowsy. The odds that you never found an Ekans on Route 10, and therefore still need to catch one on Route 11, is 1 minus its spawn rate on Route 10, which is 25%, raised to the number of encounters you had on that route. In other words, it's the probability that any one encounter is not an Ekans raised to the number of chances you had to find an Ekans. We can expect to have an average of 2.22 encounters on Route 10 to find the Voltorb. But remember, in order to have made it to Route 11, one of those encounters had to have been a Voltorb, meaning that you'll have an average of 1.22 chances to find an Ekans. So plugging that into the formula, we find that you have a 70.3% chance of not finding any Ekans on Route 10, meaning you still need to catch one on Route 11. The odds of finding at least one Ekans on Route 10 is simply one minus the probability of never finding any, since you either found an Ekans or you didn't. Then we just need to multiply the odds of finding no Ekans on Route 10 by the expected encounters to find both an Ekans and a Drowsy on Route 11, and then multiply the odds of finding at least one Ekans on Route 10 by the expected encounters to find just a Drowsy on Route 11, and add them together to find that you can expect to have an average of 4.6 eight encounters on Route 11 before you have everything you need. And then, of course, you have to boot up Pokemon Blue version and go back to Route 11 to do the whole thing over again to find a Sandshrew, since Ekans and Sandshrew are version exclusive Pokemon that need to be traded from other games. Ah, <sighs> thankfully though, this is as complicated as it gets. I mean, it's not like there's any areas where you need to catch multiple of the same Pokemon for in-game trades, and also that Pokemon may or may not have been found on multiple other routes, or areas where you need to catch three different Pokemon, all with different spawn rates, meaning I needed to account for multiple layers of alternate realities stacked on top of one another with different P's, P primes, and P double primes, and oh yeah, there's also a chance that you already found a Pikachu earlier in the game, which means that half of these alternate realities may or may not actually exist. 
I mean, thank God I don't have to deal with any of that, right? <laughs> All right, look, maybe this whole process was a little more difficult than I thought. And maybe I should have trusted the guy with a PhD who works for Oxford who said that this was too hard. But after painstakingly going through every area in the game and accounting for every minute detail and possibility, I now have the expected number of encounters to find all 53 Pokemon required to complete the Kanto Pokedex. All but four of them. Remember earlier when I said we were assuming that you'd catch every single Pokemon on your first encounter with one exception? Well, it's time for that exception. As it turns out, there are four Pokemon in the game that can only be found in the Safari Zone. For those who don't know, Battles in the Safari Zone work a little differently than regular battles. Instead of lowering a Pokemon's HP to make them easier to catch, you have to throw mud and bait at them to lower their catch rate or make them less likely to flee, something that normal wild Pokemon can't do. In effect, there's a lot more RNG involved in Safari Zone battles than usual, and you are far from guaranteed to capture something on your first attempt. In game design terms, we would refer to something like this as... Not very good. Because there's so much luck and very little strategy involved here, I can't in good conscience assume that you'll catch everything in one go, which means that not only do we need to find how many encounters you'd need to find one of these Pokemon, we also need to find the average number of tries it would take to actually catch one. Now, I'll admit, the mechanics behind the Gen 1 Safari Zone are very complicated, so I thought I'd just read a little excerpt from the Bulbapedia article on it to give you a sense of what we're dealing with here. At the start of an encounter, two counters, an angry counter and an eating counter, each turn, are set if to zero. A random eating encounter is zero on zero. zero. Opposite and deep to determine if one is set to eating and As you can see, Finding the expected number of tries to catch a Safari Zone Pokemon is a pretty hard question to answer, especially for a video that's already on page 6 of the script. So I'm going to take a slightly simpler approach and just not do any of that. Instead, I just calculated the number of encounters to find each Safari Zone Pokemon and multiplied it by 1.5 assuming it'll take you one to two tries per Pokemon. Is this a bit of a cop-out? Maybe. But after everything I've done, I'm not dealing with degrading counters and Gen 1's stupid catching system, all right? I won't do it. You can't make me. Unless you subscribe to my Patreon, where you can suggest and vote on future video topics, in which case I would literally be contractually obligated to make a whole video on it. Link in the description down below. But I know you won't do that. You cowards! But, finally, after all of that, we can simply add together the expected number of encounters for each route in the game to get our answer. The total number of encounters you will probably need to complete the Kanto Pokedex. For reference, number file's estimate was 751.59 encounters using their geometric distribution method. Adjusting for the fact that you only need to catch 53 Pokemon as opposed to 150, their method would have predicted 210.42. Were they close? Well, accounting for everything, from spawn rates to every different permutation and combination of varying rarities, the true expected number of encounters required to catch them all and get Professor Oak's seal of approval is a 254.46, meaning that number files crude, oversimplified estimation missed out on a whole 44 
encounters. You made me do this for 44 encounters. Sure, in the end, it looks like Numberphile got pretty darn close to the real answer using their far easier method. But I think there's still a valuable lesson to be learned here. If you put in the work, if you don't take shortcuts, you can find the perfect solution to any problem. But you probably should just take the shortcuts because you can get pretty damn close and save yourself a ton of time. I Take the path of least resistance, y'all. Don't be a dummy. Everyone who's always roasting me in the comments whenever I take the slightest shortcut or omit some tiny detail, it don't actually matter that much. Not for a damn YouTube video. We're not solving. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alkazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby. This show would not be possible without your support, so thank you.